There's one other thing I'll talk about before I look at solutions, which are very simple. Very simple. And that's the microchipped population. That's the one that probably sounds most bizarre, as I said earlier, but it is so close. We're, we're already microchipping domestic animals as a matter of course. The Queen's had the corgis done. Did you see that? Last year, she's had the corgis microchipped and linked to a computer. Prince Charles, next you watch. He'll be. <laughs> sort him out. It's funny. The technique that is being used to bring in the microchip population is another major mass mind manipulating technique. I call it the stepping stones technique. And a very good example of that is the European Union and what they have in America, um, the North uh, American Free Trade Agreement, which is a free trade area, which is where the European Union started out, if you recall, and also what's happening in another free trade area in the Pacific Australia area known as APEC. The idea is to have the world government, the bank and all the rest of it, and the next stage down from that will be the European Union, the American Union, which will be this North American free trade area, right the way through the Americas from North to South America, in the, an, a, an American version of the European Union, and a Pacific version of it. They will be the three next stages down from the world government. And the stepping stones technique is how they're being introduced. If you take the European Union, if you started out at the end of the last war, and what we're heading to now had been suggested, one bank, one currency, centralized control of a super state. Understandably, I know what my father was, would have said who fought in that war, excuse me a minute, can I just have a quick word here? We've just spent the last five years with 55 million people killed and uh, many more severely injured to stop that happening. And you're asking us to do it without a bullet being fired. You must be joking. Go and have a cup of tea. So what the stepping stones technique does, although it knows where it's heading, it does it in stages. It gets away with what it can get away with, first of all, and then starts to move it along, and it presents every step as independent of all the others so you don't see the pattern. So what was suggested after the last war? Not a European superstate, because that had no chance at that time. It was the common market, just a free trade area, ladies and gentlemen, nothing to worry about. And by the way, if we don't join, we starve. Little problem like that, you know. <laughs> well, we'd better join then, I guess, you know. <coughs> so... Suddenly, some of the states of Europe start to fuse their economies together in a free trade area. Now we're in the web. Because it's uh, suggested very strongly that if anyone pulls out, there will be a co economic chaos, certainly in the short term. So now we're in the spider's web. So the process then starts of evolving a free trade area into a European centralized superstate. And First, we have start having commissions which start dictating to nation states. Then we have um, talk about uh, the central bank. And w interestingly, you know, one of the things that was put forward uh, to justify the one currency was the currency chaos in Europe. Like when the pound fell out of the European monetary system after the government had spent a colossal fortune trying to keep it in there a few years ago. Well, you know, this currency chaos, one, one currency would sort this problem. Interesting, therefore, that the person who attacked the pound and caused that chaos was a frontman for the House of Rothschild called George Soros, a world currency speculator, George Soros Bilderberg Group. The chancellor at the time who spent all that money and eventually pulled the pound out of the monetary system of Europe was Norman Lamont, Bilderberg Group. Now, when I was talking in Sweden just a few weeks ago, I was talking about this and some member of the, uh, the audience in Sweden came up and said, I couldn't believe it when you mentioned that guy, George Soros. He said, what happened in Sweden, he said, was um, before we went into the European community, um, all the opinion polls were very strongly against going in. 
He said, then this guy, George Soros, Bilderberg Group, started attacking the Swedish currency. The Swedish government tried to defend the currency under the prime ministership of Carl Bildt, Bilderberg Group, and eventually chaos ensued. And a great fear started to go into the Swedish psyche of, oh my goodness, we need protection. What's going on here? We can't stand alone. Even speculators are taking our currency apart. After that, the opinion polls for going into the European community flipped to the majority saying yes, and in they went. So now, stepping stones, we're now in a situation where we are light years away from what we actually joined. <coughs> stepping stones. Only now are some people saying, excuse me, have you seen how far we've come? It's interesting that um, right along the line, as the stepping stones uh, are put forward, anyone who uh, uh, challenges the stepping stones is then um, manipulated into continuing the journey. I was speaking in Denmark um, at the time I was uh, in the Swedish area also, and what they did was had a referendum which voted against Maastricht, against the European Union. They then had another referendum, not long afterwards, which then said, yes, we'll go in. And as one national newspaper editor in um, Denmark said to me, he was told by one of the big pro-Maastricht people in Denmark, we're just going to go on having referendums until we get the result we want. <laughs> that's how it works, because we are in the land of the free. So that's the technique, and it's being used to bring in the microchip population. And the big stepping stone to that is the cashless society. Coins and bits of paper might not seem to be a great defender of freedom, but they are for this reason. If you go into a shop now, or a, um, a garage or whatever, and you hand over cashless money, electronic money, a credit card, they put it through that machine. And they say sometimes, oh, I'm ever so sorry, the, the computer won't accept your card. And if you've paid the bill, you might be a bit surprised, but you've got an alternative at the moment. So you say, oh, well, okay, I'll we'll have to check that out. Okay, I'll pay cash. What happens when there's no cash and that computer says no to electronic money, your credit card, or the microchip that is planned to replace it? Suddenly, the computer is deciding, or whoever uh, programs it, what, where, and if you purchase. That's the idea. And if there's one thing in all this that is most important to reject, in my humble opinion, it is microchipping of people, because the implications are enormous. Some electronics people who've seen this sort of thing emerging have started to speak out. I've been reading some stuff um, by a guy in America called Carl Sanders, an electronics wizard. And he's pointing out that, in fact, he's talking himself about his own experience of attending meetings in America and Europe, attended by Henry Kissinger and the CIA, into microchipping of people. Not, is it right, is it moral, but how do we get them to accept it? And as he points out, once people are microchipped, it's not just messages going from the microchip to the computer that should concern us, it's what's coming the other way. According to him, they can create, through this means, mass hysteria, mass depression, in other words, manipulate our emotions, and isolate one microchip in one, peop one person. I got some idea of the possibilities when I realized how Sky Television works. You know the satellite television network we have in Britain? Well, um, if you, um, you want to join the Sky Network thing, okay, you send your money off or whatever, and they send you a card and it's programmed to descramble the channels you've paid for. Very straightforward. But, if you want more channels than you've paid for once you've got the card, you would think, well, I did anyway, <laughs> that you would send them more money and they'd send you another card programmed to descramble the channels you want added to it. No, no. 
what you do is you pick up the phone and you ring their number, it's in Scotland I think, and they say, uh, okay, what channel do you, oh, I'll have that second movie channel, mate, thank you very much, yeah, um, and they say, okay, put your television on the channel that you want, all fuzz, scrambled. So while you're still on the phone, they say, um, okay, just tell me what's happening to your screen. Only the channel appearing before your eyes, that's all. So I thought, how do they do that? I heard about it, gave them a ring. How do you do that? What they do is they send out a signal from this central, what do you call it, technology, I guess, and it goes to every decoder linked to the sky system, but only your card with your number on it picks it up, it reprograms the card to take the new channel, and it comes up before your eyes. When you think there are two types of science in the world, there's the one that uh, is taught in the universities and appears on the television, and there's another one that is light years ahead, secret science, what they can actually do compared with what we see they can do with things like the Sky Television example are, are vastly, vastly advanced. I wrote a book called The Robots Rebellion and um, I s talked about this um, microchip population um, idea. And I've even been uh, surprised by the speed of it. I turned on the BBC a few months ago, I don't know if you saw this, it was funny. Tomorrow's World, you know the science program on the BBC? They had this item on microchipped people, see. What they said was, um, there's this problem with health records. I thought something must be done then, I suppose. <coughs> the problem, apparently, uh, was that they don't keep health records for long enough. So they're suggesting microchipping people with their health records to overcome this problem. Now, I never went to university, but I can actually see a solution to the problem of not keeping health records for long enough. <laughs> Keep them longer. There you go. Let's all go and have a cup of tea. That's that sorted out. No, no. No, no. No, that's too simple. We've got to microchip people. The other thing they said was that um, doctors would like to have access to medical records if people have an accident. So microchip them. So, takes things on. I don't know what, about you, but when I was a kid, my mother was always saying to me, you have clean underpants on our Dave, you might have an accident. You ever get some of that? Yeah. <laughs> My mother's worst nightmare was not um, me having an accident so much as me having an accident with dirty underpants on. That was her worst nightmare. <laughs> but all these years later, we've moved into the modern world. Now it's, you make sure you're microchipped our Dave, you might have an accident. Anyway, in this item, and I checked the date, it wasn't April Fool's Day or anything like that. They had this woman um, who had had an operation and had been microchipped with her medical records. Oh, it's ever so convenient, she said. I'm eating the cushion in the front room by now, you know. <laughs> and then what happens? You know in the supermarkets, <coughs> they've got that thing they put across the barcode. Doctor walks into shop with one of them. Rubs it up her front. <laughs> up on the screen comes this woman's medical records. I thought, I'm going to wake up in a minute here, you know. But, <laughs> but at the end of the item came the key little clip, not very long, by the managing director of the company that's produced the technology, the microchip. This is just the start, he says. We can put on this chip medical records, financial records, passport details, social security details, uh, prison record, the flipping lot. Exactly. That is the idea. And it's been moving along, unmolested, for a very long time, because its great power is secrecy, and when you think that so much of the mainstream media is controlled by the very force that wishes to bring it about, it's not surprising that so little of it has come out. But, I feel we're now in a time of enormous change, a great jump in human evolution, and therefore an energy of change is bringing this stuff to the surface, and its secrecy, its great power, is being unveiled. And I 
certainly don't want to be seen to be condemning the people I have talked about. And, I mean, I've heard some people who've investigated this without the spiritual balance, and they're saying, oh, hang them, hang them, hang them, oh, rubbish. The people involved in this manipulation are, yes, exhibiting their state of being at this time in their eternal journey. They are exhibiting their attitude to life and the state of their mind, okay. But they're also making a massive statement about us which we would do very, very well to acknowledge and think about. I, I don't talk about the Carringtons and the Kissingers and the Rockefellers with hate in my heart or um, condemnation. I just think we ought to know what's going on because we can stop it going on. Because what I've just described is actually a massive statement about us because it can only happen because of us and the fact that we have conceded our right to our own power and our own control of our own lives.